and then pass you the baton. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Darlene Lim is a geobiologist based at NASA Ames, where she leads research in the development of operational concepts for human scientific exploration of our solar system. Uh, Dr. Lim is the PI for Subsea, Basalt Research Program as well, the Deputy PI of NASA SURVEY on field investigations to enable solar system science and exploration. And I believe a few of you on this call who are on the resource team have been coordinating with Darlene, which has been really fantastic. And Darlene is also the PI of the Pavilion Lake Research Project. She spent over 20 years leading field research programs around the world, and we're thrilled to have her in conversation with Deva and Jeff uh, and all of us here for the discussion on supporting the future of human life on the surface of the moon. Thank you for joining us, Darlene. My pleasure. Would you like to say hello? Okay, oh, please say hello and feel free to add a little bit to your introduction and let the class get to know you. No, it's, this is my pleasure, seriously, an honor to be here. Um, I've been able to work with yourself, Ariel, and Deva, and Jeff, um, and Cody, and many others over a long time now. And um, every time it is such a joy, I learned so much. I was kind of hoping that we just skip over me because I want to keep going on these slides that Deva is presenting. Um, I'm having such a good time learning. Um, and so that's fundamentally my experience every time I, you know, I get a chance to interact with you all and I'm very, very grateful for it. So um, I hope I can be of assistance today and um, look forward to the conversation. Hey, Darlene, I haven't seen you since uh, we were out in Hawaii together. So nice to that's see right. you. It's <laughs> so nice to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. So building on this conversation now that we can have um, thinking about you know, EQUES in terms of the chambers that might be built uh, to sustain human life, whether it's HLS or going forward, you know, habitation chambers on the surface of the moon, then the, the suits for EVA. I would just love to you know, pose a first question to both Deva and Darlene. How are you guys thinking about the amazing analog work that's been undertaken over the last few years with programs like Basalt and, and Resource and others? How are we thinking about taking the analog work into this new domain where we're going to be planning for human missions on the surface of the moon and you know later on to Mars and then after that I hope the class raises your hand or unmutes and, and starts asking some questions as well. Darlene, Darlene you go you go first and I'll, I'll follow up but um, again why don't you go first. Darlene's okay. the, the PI for our basalt work. Jeff and I uh, participated. Now we have resource and um, uh, she has about five uh, analog missions she needs to tell you about so. <laughs> Well, there, yeah, um, so analogs serve a wonderful purpose in that, um, you know, you kind of, you go out into an environment, it can be actually in a lab, it can be um, in a extreme environment, if you will, somewhere that offers us the opportunity to study, you know, this planet as it pertains to life in extreme environments, um, you know, the relationship between life and geology, chemistry, et cetera. And then at the same time, you can layer on top of that um, operational questions, engineering questions, systems-based questions that you want to ask as a researcher. Um, and what I like to do in the analog set um, that I'm part of is actually integrate the science with the ops, with the engineering and the tech development so that we holistically look at what is going to be of value when we send uh, human or robotic you know, systems to the surface of the moon, to Mars and, and anywhere in between, frankly. And, um, and I find that by bringing all those systems together, then you really get to flush out what, um, what does actually support science and exploration? What does actually support discovery? And then also how do you enable scientists to consider the environment through this very narrow lens of your human explorer and or your, your robotic explorer? And how, how do you enable them to be able to make not just decisions, but decisions in near real time while the mission is actually progressing? So that's actually, um, something which is is fairly difficult to grapple with. And we, in the moment, tend to actually take data in as a science team, um, you know, dealing with, with a robotic mission, and then have the luxury of time to be able to consider that data that's come in and then make decisions from there. In the future, as you know, as as um, as you were you were just experiencing, we're gonna get into a system, an exploration system on the moon, for example, that allows us to be there much more frequently allows us to be conducting EVAs for longer periods of time. And hopefully, you know, for us to be able to explore in places which offer a lot of interest, whether it's for the potential for resources and supporting human life in the future on the surface of the moon, or even just, you know, pure discovery in, in the realm of natural science. 
So analogs allow us to go to places on earth that um, enable us to explore all of these different questions um, in somewhat of a lower risk environment, if you will. But, but at the same time, there is still the risk to the team when you're operating in, this, in these extreme environments. So in fact, a lot of the considerations that we walk into these analog environments with are very akin and very, um, you know, very much match some of the considerations that you, you have to take in, into play um, when, you're, when you're thinking about sending humans uh, elsewhere. Um, and so we operate on land, um, we operate underwater, on water, and it really depends what the fundamental driving questions are of our team. Um, and then that in turn um, takes us down a decision path to choose exactly where we wanna go geographically and then actually how we wanna deal with the data thereafter. So there's a real process, a real evolution um, that kind of binds all the analogs that I've been involved with and then binds the work within the analogs that we, that we do. So I'll pause there, there's a lot to download and, and let uh, David take over. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks. And we can, um, hopefully this is, you know, you have, you all have some questions and ask us tough questions in terms, of, I can just say a little bit more. First, my, gosh, I don't know if it's an aha moment, but it seems so simple, but it wasn't until we probably went out to the basalt uh, in craters of the moon in Idaho with, with Darlene and, and um, colleagues that when you're really trying to do that in lava fields, I, I can't say I, you know, had run around lava fields before. And these things that were so obvious, but they really were just like, aha, there we are. We as humans, we're really pretty darn mobile, right? We have our boots on and we and had visions of, you know, great robotics, right? We're at MIT. I know all the, the, the cheetah and all the best robotics going around. That was such um, crazy terrain. There's the lava tubes. It, there's not, there's not a robot that can um, maneuver in that field. So I said, uh-oh, there goes our robotics. I mean, just really amazing. And, and actually Jeff and I were, well, of course, talking recently in about the helicopter on Mars and lots to say about that. Um, but again, it was in basalt, we were craters of the moon and we had an area, we had drones. And I don't know, Darlene, if that's the first mission that we had the, the drones on um, in basalt, but having that air coverage and having them go into, we we're looking at lava tubes, that return on investment you're saying scientific return so we had the human explorers we had the aerial coverage the aerial coverage you know coming down into these um you know craters and really hard to get places and then of course we had all of our measurements you know lidar 3d scans and just you know for us to take a while well, you're doing your research and just take that moment to um imagine you know what the real it's extreme environments like it's so important because i actually think it'll it'll enable us to do different research, different technology technology development as engineers and different, uh, you know, sharpening maybe the science questions that we're asking as, as well. Because just that, 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 the whole point is that appreciation of the lunar environment, of the Mars environment. It's almost like, well, maybe we don't know it until we get there. So these analog um, experiences and then in Hawaii, I'm almost embarrassed to say no, the Hawaii one. That was that was great. That was that was Darlene's good words. Like, yeah, we have to be in Hawaii to study volcanoes. Are you kidding me? What what's extreme about Hawaii? I was like, I had never been there in my life. And I'm like, woohoo, <laughs> we get to go to Hawaii. <laughs> but uh, when you're in you know volcanic national park and the places we were, uh, I mean, safety was paramount. You know, you're walking around in these terrains. These lava terrains are, are really extreme. You have to be extremely careful. Of course, we were trying to simulate EVA, and so we had backpacks and extra weight on people. But um, you know, all that to say is just really being out in the field, always. But being out in the field uh, always uh, teaches me, I think, as much as as I need to learn about you know what I'm what I'm designing for. You know, what questions am I asking? And really that applied, how can we make our applied work? Because we get, I think, caught in the lab a little bit and I can show you lots of thermal modeling and things like that because we get, get, we get down and deep in terms of the theory and our academic work. But just to really open up our minds and say, what is it gonna be like to operate in these extreme environments? So that's, um, you, know, you know it, but boy, does it, it come home when you're in these analog environments. And, and, and just to also add on to what Darlene said, this is, um, you know, it's the operational environment. We're choreographing, I guess, if you will, the real uh, operations, as, as real as we can get for the moon and Mars. And so that necessarily puts in time delays. It, it puts in the teamwork and the coordination. Boy, oh boy, the, the teamwork and the coordination is not trivial. And then I guess it, I think a challenge for 
um, lots of us on online here for for the technologists say, okay, the scientists are, they're doing their great work. If we're gonna send, if we're gonna immerse them in, in virtual reality, if we're gonna you know, give them our, you know, our great robots, we have to uh, try, we have to enhance the science. So, I mean, again, I think that's really our role. So we have science, high priority, scientific, you know, lunar objectives, and then say, okay, what technologies then can, can we field that improve the science you know if we're not enhancing science then then they don't need our technologies so that to me is all those are some of the kind of the fundamental questions and, and some of the some of the learnings from the the and usefulness for the analogs but that if statement is not thing, uh, obvious. sorry go ahead jeff yeah um regarding the drones uh, this this occurred to me when i was watching the mars helicopter and i, I mentioned it to Deva, but it, it'd be of interest to you and the class i think you know, when we one of the things that, that we developed here at MIT was the, were these path planning programs where you can look at the topography of a region and figure out where you can and where you can't go and and produce um, you know minimal energy traverses. But the problem was that uh, given the the data to topographic the best topographical data that we started out with at Craters of the Moon in Hawaii were really insufficient to do really accurate path planning. And it wasn't until, remember when they flew the drone over and produced a digital right. elevation map down to a few centimeters, and then we put that into the path planning and it really made a difference. And, and so I think that's, you know, when they were talking about possible uses of a helicopter on Mars, and you, you might say the same thing for hoppers on the moon, you know, rocket powered hoppers, you can, you can actually produce these much more accurate topographical maps than you can get from orbit um, and use that for path planning. So um, just something to think about for the use of, of helicopters on Mars and hoppers on the moon. Yeah, and again, that, that, you know, that, that speaks thematically to the enhancement of science and discovery and exploration. And, and I was gonna say just to, to a comment on Deva's comments is that, um, and Jeff's, is that it's not always obvious that the, the system should be there to support science. So the tech should be there to support science. And so I think that being um, a, a bet, that is really a benefit of analogs is that it, it injects a whole bunch of humility into the process and then realization that like, oh, this is hard. There's a collective hardness to all this and we should make it as you know, less hard as possible if we can for those that actually have to do the work. Um, and that sounds like common sense, but it's not necessarily always at the at the forefront of you know the vision for what's happening at, you know in, in front of us in terms of design and, and engineering so um yeah I, I find that personally as a scientist one of the joys of, of working in this collective realm of analogs indeed and uh your discussion already has generated a bunch of interest in the class i think we have four standing questions now to get through so let's start with anish i think you were first and then larissa then fang zhang and then cody um, thanks, Professor Newman, for a, for a great talk. Um, I, I had a question about your kind of sailing experiences and in in, along the lines of analogs. Um, I, I was wondering, um, in terms of designing spacesuits or understanding how um, astronauts might experience something in environments on the moon, how have your sailing experiences kind of contributed to that when it comes to understanding, you know, what people need to survive in, in low resource types of environments? Oh, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. I love to talk about the, kind of more the personal side of exploration. I don't usually get to, to talk about that. So, well, um, first, um, survival. <laughs> I mean, just to put it, I mean, every day we worried about staying alive. And so I think that's a lot like, you know, so we um, talk about extreme, you know, ex extreme, uh, you know, exploration in sea and space. But when you're sailing around the world, even though, uh, you know, you only take photographs when it's beautiful and sunny out. Right when you're in 50 knots of wind and no sails and putting a sea anchor up, you're not taking videos and, and photographs. So no one knows about when, when your life's on the line. Those aren't things that are recorded. You know the the nice the nice days are. So fundamentally, it's uh, that um, realization that your job is uh, every day to to survive. And we had colleagues and, and and friends and folks who who lost their lives. So that that level of um, <laughs> humility, for sure. That but. Um, you can do what you can. And then I guess the other thing is um, for, for sailing, um, offshore sailing like that, um, you don't get to make a major mistake and take it back. 
I, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I make mistakes every day and work and you know, goofed up here and there. If we make a major error that uh, can easily lead to disaster, if not loss of life. So again, you know, stories with friends and I think there's people, um, you know, making the navigation error, you know, hitting a reef and, 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 and you know, losing, losing their boat. And these friends, thank goodness they didn't lose, lose their life. But something you know, you're sleep derived. <laughs> so the other similarities with what Astros, the circadian experiment that we ran, that um, you, you sleep about four hours, not together, but total four hours in every 24 hour cycle. So you train your body, it's, so it's crazy. And you can adapt to that, which is amazing. The first week is, is really hard. Um, then you, you kind of train your body. So we would do three hour shifts. So I would say those, you know, the survival, I'm not taking anything for, for granted. Um, um, just that, uh, you know, trying and your, I, I, I would do, you know, mental and mathematical gymnastics to try to um, assess myself, like how alert I was. And I thought I was at usually about 80%. Um, proficient, if you will, and sometimes 70%. And you know, I was having started. So just to know that that's kind of the state you're in, you're, you're typically pretty um, sleep deprived. And so uh, again, and then when something breaks and everything breaks, that, that's the other thing. Boy, um, having some engineering skills was, I mean, and being creative. Well, I don't know if I have time I can tell you, I can tell you later on, I have a good story about, you know, going across the Pacific Ocean on olive oil, you know, same viscosity as a uh, is um, hydraulic fluid. So we lost all, we lost our steering, we lost our hydraulics across. We had, you know, a thousand miles to go to the nearest rock. So um, you get creative, which is the fun part. You know, you use all the resources you have because you're on your little spaceship and that's all you have. So hopefully that helps. I, you know, those are some, there's lots of stories, uh, but that was my, it's kind of my analogy and, and some of the lessons learned um, being handy and fixing everything because everything, everything will break. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I think it's my turn. Uh, hi, Deva. Hi, Darlene. Thanks so much for being here. I have a question about the um, how do you th when planning analog missions, um, how do you think about the right timing for one? Because with your ex uh, with your recounting of just now your experiences with basalt, like even um, that that seemed like a time where. Um, you thought, okay, we, we, we have a goal, we have a variety of tools, whether it's drones, whether it's humans, whether it's rovers, and then maybe let's explore, you know, before we come we, before we commit to one or two tools or something. Um, I work, I work on uh, food uh, systems for space. And I know that NASA is gearing up for um, like one year long analog missions at JSC. Um, to study um, specifically concentrating um, study on food and, and how um, the crew deals with food for such long durations. Um, so how do you think about when in this development process to put in analog missions and how do you get the most bang for the buck, I guess? Because these are long, expensive to implement. Um. Yeah, I'll start answering that question, but um, there's a there's a lot to unpack for sure. So there's there are a few practicalities as an example. Um, so within the analog itself, once you actually you know secure the funding, you have your idea, you know where you want to go. So we've kind of skipped a whole lot of process already, but that you know once you get to that state where you you have everything roughly set in terms of vision and location, um, I tend to you know I start with the safety element. Um, what you're doing is probably not as beholden to this, but we look at where we wanna go um, and ensure that it's it's actually somewhere we can go safely. And, and then we try to consider the elements um, as it pertains to when is a good time to go? When is it not the, the rainy season or the hurricane season or you know anything else like that extreme that could really curtail your ability to, to get your work done. And then we look broadly at that question, what are the things that could stop us from being able to get our work done? And that can be anything from you know natural systems to to human-made systems, um, things such as you know I've had all sorts of experiences with um, park protection protocol, um, indigenous peoples, uh, local stakeholders. So I, I personally try to you know examine all of the stakeholders and put that together um, in a 
in, in a matrix that allows me to understand when the ideal, the optimal moment is to actually enter into that, that system. And then there's also the science and the exploration. Because as a simple example, um, some of our systems when we began, for example, with the basalt program, were not geared towards moist nor fairly acidic environments, such as those, those that we were working in or in and around the um, hydrothermal systems of volcanoes. And so um, we had to take that into consideration in terms of how the proximity within which we worked around some of these more dangerous elements um, to, the, to the technical you know, components of our mission. Um, we also had to take into account where we needed to go for the science. And then again, measure the safety of what the scientists wanted versus their, their general safety. And, and field scientists will have a propensity to want to uh, kind of push the envelope in terms of the safety to really, you know, uh, bring back the prize that they're interested in. And so um, there's a lot of kind of um, countermeasures to make sure that we, we get them as much as they want within reason, because there are, you know, bigger picture issues we have to, we have to contend with. Now, that's a lot of specifics, but, but um, as it pertains to like managing and trying to understand when is a good time to go into the field. I will say that, you know, I've looked broadly at our analog programs and the programs I've been involved with. We spend about 90, 93% of the time outside of the field. And just like Davis said, we, you know, when, when you look at a field program and an analog program, you tend to see the pictures of when the researchers are in the field because those are the beautiful shots. You don't see them, you know, having telecons, uh, video conferences, typing emails, crunching data because that's not as beautiful. Um, but but it is part of the process, and it's a huge part of the process. Um, having consensus and alignment across the team is what we spend a lot of time doing until we get to the understanding of when it is we want to go into the field and why. Um, now, in terms of taking a step back and looking at all of the different analogs and when is a good time to initiate an analog test and when, you know, when is it appropriate? I think it really comes down to what is the question that you are asking and when is it a good time to move beyond um, a controlled environment into one which is less controlled? And this comes back to the statements that Deva was making around the fact that when you are in the field, there is a lot more that comes at you that suddenly sort of upends many of your static considerations and it makes things more interesting for lack of a better expression. But, but when that happens, then you have to react. You have to be flexible. You have to see if you've designed something that's too rigid to be reactive, or if you've actually designed something like bamboo, you know, that is strong yet flexible and can, and can really ebb and flow as the dynamic nature of your field program plays out. So there is that moment in time, that realization when it's a good time to go. And then, um, you know, then all of that other stuff that I started with uh, comes into play. So yeah, I'll pause there. That I'll, I'll just add a, a few things, agree with everything uh, Darlene said. The only things that I have to add um, in terms of um, this analog and the analog we work, you know, in these analogs are, are really full fledged missions. There, if you back up from that a little bit, Maybe I like to think of test bedding technologies, especially. So in terms of if you have some new technologies and of course, and trying to, but still trying to get them out of the lab, but to, uh, it's a little bit more systems approach, a little bit more, you know, if you get the opportunity, you know, uh, there's a, you know, you know, nutrition and things. So thinking about maybe the next step too is also with the test bedding, because you want to look at all those interactions. You know, if you're working on one thing deeply, you know, and then try to see it in the, the context, the mission context, but you don't necessarily maybe need to be out in, the mission or completely in the immersed um, hero environment or something like that. So I see there might be a step there in terms of, again, that, that you might take. And I'd say it's never, it's never too early to uh, <laughs> um, you know, write the proposals in for, for analogs or participating. Um, uh, we, we encourage all of you to try to, uh, again, even uh, if, you know, if you ever get the chance to some of you flying parabolas, if you ever get the chance to go under isolation and, and hero, someone says, put your name in the hat. I mean, apply, it's never too early to apply for those opportunities. Uh, and then timing wise, we have a, the, just finish on, we have an interesting experience now with the resource mission that um, again, Darlene and I and, and Jen Hellman and you know, Cody, Alex is on. So wonderful team. That proposal was submitted uh, 2018, Darlene, 2019. I'm losing track of time. But a few years ago, we're going to do all this great breakthrough learner research, right? All this, all these great volatiles and things like that. Boy, oh boy! I think to our surprise, uh, pleasant surprise, 
you know, NASA accelerated plans, which is fantastic for lunar exploration. So now we've, 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 uh, I mean, we're catching up with that. Now there is a Viper mission. So we said, okay, so what's the applied program? There's a real mission called Viper. So, you know, our research now, we want to be, uh, you know, very much in step with that, you know, very much in step with that. We're still researchers, so we still want to push technology, science, but we also need to circle back, I guess, is the way to say it, to make sure that we're relevant, that we're relevant to now an operational mission. Oh, uh, I think it's my turn. So um, I, I have a question for Professor Newman. So uh, is there a lifetime for the uh, spacesuit? I mean, is there a regulation about after how many uh, EVAs this uh, spacesuit should be retired? And uh, does the spacesuit has uh, have such a sensing system to indicate how much the spacesuit is weird and when, when and uh, which part? should be repaired. Ah, um, thanks. Part, sorry, uh, second quick question is, uh, how, how does this spacesuit repair the lunar dust on the lunar surface? Yeah, thank you. Great. Yeah, great question. So uh, it's called talk about the current systems, um, the, the current NASA systems. Um, the EMU, uh, it, as I meant, is mentioned quickly, it was used for the, the shuttle program, you know, 20, 20 plus years of shuttle, and now over 20 years for the ISS. So it, um, had multiple EVAs, but then it would be inspected for maintenance. It would literally, in the shuttle program, would come down to, to Earth, to, to ILC, the, the, the contractors, uh, and Hamilton, um, it's called Sunstrand. So we'd come back down to the contractors, and it would have, I kid you not, 1,500 hours of seam inspection for just let's talk about the suit part. Um, that's pretty time intensive. That's pretty time intensive. And that would be, it changed a little bit, but, but that would be after six to 10 EVAs. And, and that's that's what we did during during the shuttle. And then we changed when when requirements change, <laughs> requirements change for space station. We're going to build a space station. We're going to get up at space station. The technology is pretty much the, the same, and there was a, not much in technology improvement. But the certification had to, we can't bring them down. We can't bring the suits down from space station. So the certification on maintenance. Uh, changed drastically to see um, how you could minimize and how you could have astronauts on on board doing taking over much of the inspection of the suit so we didn't have that that huge hit of needing you know it to come down to the earth so that's um anyhow that's there's a lot more to it but that's just to give you an idea um great question in terms of uh, maintenance and you know making making sure you have a, a flight a flight system you you know um, and uh, you probably know the issues with the pump and on space station now we, we've, uh, that's a very, very dangerous system um, again, for the life support system and having water in the helmet. And um, all I can say is thank goodness uh, um, we you know, have still every astronaut made it through that. That, that is a life and death situation um, there. So uh, replacing parts, how long do they last life cycle of, of um, not just the suit, but all of the components of the suit, it's, uh, it's pretty rigorous. I mean, NASA has NASA has specifications for the life cycle for all the components, but you know, we we, we can be surprised. We we can always be surprised. Also, uh, we're fielding old technology. Um, you know, the, the the shuttle suit was its original life cycle is just a, a decade. It's just a 10, 10 years, and of course, it can be recertified. But we're using older technology um, that is quite. Uh, quite close to the end of its life cycle. And so now it, they're replacing new, that's why we need a new lunar suit. For sure, we need a new lunar suit. That's the, that's the important point um, to respond there to your comment. This, the, um, sorry, what, what was the second question? Um, so another question is, the, is there a sensing um, system on the space suit too? Yeah. Oh no, that's where you come in. No, 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 that's where we need the sensor networks and all the wearables. And there's a whole bunch of people online. Uh, we we do have biomedical, uh, we do have biomedical sensors. And Jeffrey, you know, so um, um, EEGs. We're, we're taking some 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 measurements, um, of just a few onboard measurements. And we actually always have. I um, mean, there's a famous, you know, in Apollo 13. There's a famous scene where the astronauts uh, do a mutiny and they take off those medical sensors. But, but that is true. We still do have um, electrodes on people, um, just monitoring, again, case of emergency, things, things like that. But we need 
what you're all, you know, wearable sensing and especially, uh, you know, self healing, all these things, you know, what, what could we do? Especially I think about, you know, the bio suit, we have pressure right on the skin. Can it be a fancy ACE bandage? If, if there's a tear or abrasion, we know what the lunar regolith is like, all those that sharp. So if there's a tear or abrasion, could we put on another, another, you know, wrap, wrap, a, Jeff and I call it like a smart ACE bandage. And so we think about what it should be in the future, you know, how, how, and what kind of sensing, um, and I didn't, uh, I didn't have time. We looked at astronaut injuries from the suit as well. A lot of astronauts, actually 26 astronauts have had major shoulder surgery because of injuries from the current the, the, the EMU, actually the, the planar EMU. Anyhow, that's a whole nother story. So we've, we've put eyes inside the suit. This was Ali Anderson's great work to be pressure sensors, like put them on your body. And then we were measuring the impact and the forces uh, that the suit was causing, especially around the shoulder areas, this is a side bearing. So again, that's that's a great place for internal sensors. You want to measure how the human is interacting uh, with the suit. But uh, but that sensing is just for the uh, monitoring uh, uh, astronaut, not monitoring the spacesuit itself, right? That's correct. That's correct. Well, the suit uh, oxygen level, all the life support levels are monitored. So. We have that, that's, you know, onboard monitoring, I guess you could call it because we know, you know, how much, you know, your, your oxygen tank, your life support, where, where you're at. And it wraps into the analog environments when we go out in the field and we're simulating the astronaut too, you, you want to make sure you're giving them that, that life support information. Okay, if you're walking this, you know, we can model, if you're walking this far, you have this much oxygen, you're using this much rate, we want to give them all of their life support information as they're uh, doing the rail mission, but also if they're in the analogs. And I think we have time for probably one more question, which will be Cody. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think my question sort of ties together a lot of what you guys have been talking about with analogs and safety and trying to push the envelope with research technologies. Um, we obviously need things like the new suit and hopefully something like the bio suit. Um, and there are so many new technologies that we could really make use of for um, human exploration. How do we convince NASA that these new great technologies that are really pushing the envelope are safe enough for something that really is so dependent on safety, like a spacesuit, like the biosuit? Hmm. You can you can go first, Darlene, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that there's convincing is a process and probably an art at the same time, right? And um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, Dave will be, will be able to speak very deeply on the engineering element of it. Um, I think that the testing as much as possible in high fidelity, you know, well-selected, well, -selected, well um, thought through high fidelity environments, such as what David was showing, you know, where you're working in a controlled environment underwater and then taking it to a, a, a less controlled environment underwater um, and, and moving along that spectrum will always help. There are always um, discoveries, you know, the, the devil in the detail that comes out as you really start to push that envelope. Now, will that, you know, definitively convince NASA to take a, a chance on this new technology? Um, not necessarily. But the encouraging component of what's going on in our world right now is that I see more and more that there are programs within NASA that are really trying to absorb lower TRL um, innovations into, into the thought process, into the implementation process for, for exploration and for science, um, both for you know, just purely robotic systems and, and robotic missions as well as, as human missions. So, so that, that shift in mentality, I think will really also come into play it literally, you know, starting next year, as we start to see these clips landers go to the moon um, and go frequently to the moon and really push the envelope on the, um, the the frequency as well as the type of payload that's being brought to the surface. And I think that will become more and more experimental and um, that will help NASA, I think, really gauge the, the, the comfort that they have in terms of pushing that risk envelope. So I think to really enable, um, you know, lower TRL technologies to, to kind of more rapidly make their way into the system. There has to be a really broad um, 
philosophical um, change and a perspective change. And that's only gonna happen as we start to take those risks. So good news is those risks are starting to get taken. Um, so I'll pause there. Yeah, thanks. So couple couple thoughts on this from, from our side as researchers in, in academia. Um, you know, we need to we need to be excellent. We need to prove our technology. So you know, let's take the, the bio suit. It's it's R and D. We don't have a flight system, and so we have to be really careful to say, okay, when are we ready? When can we develop this and that? And and um, so that's really important to say, um, you know, work on it, push our technology. Say if, if they're ready, you know, for adoption, and you know, keep keep working on them like that. So I think there's kind of the internal academic part of just, uh, you know, I'm bulletproof. And uh, it's not just all about papers and publishing, but we want to have, I mean, we want to have a really good case so that no one can say no, you know, say this is better in mass savings. This is better in cost saving. This is better in fabrication, boom, boom, boom. So we need to have a great story based, you know, on our technology and development. That's, that's with my academic hat on, <laughs> with my NASA <laughs> deputy administrator hat on when I got to this value. Um, a lot in terms of leadership. Uh, NASA is much too risk averse. Um, now there's safety and wellness. I, I really think, hopefully there's, a, you know, it's, it's about risk, but it's about technology demonstrations. So again, back to suits what we're talking about today, kind of EVA hybrid, let's, let's do a test bed. Let's fly something that's gas pressurized and has some MCP arms 